Yes, we are in Galatians chapter 5, and just before we dive into the fruit of the Spirit, we were compelled to look at the antithesis to the fruit of the Spirit, which is the works of the flesh. We were compelled to look at the fact that there are certain elements that hinder God's move in our lives, and we needed to deal with that. And we spent three weeks looking at combating the flesh. You all remember that? And we closed it off last week, and now we are at verse 22 of Galatians chapter 5. Over our series, we looked at the def definition of the works of the flesh. We defined it. We identified it that there is a battle that, we take, that takes place within us. And it's really a, a, a battle between two natures, as it were, the, 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 the spirit and the flesh. And we, and we also determined that the Bible has given us a key solution to win this war against the flesh. And we said that that key solution is to walk in the spirit. Amen? So he says, if we walk in the spirit, we will not fulfill the lust of the flesh. And we dealt with that last day and thought that it was interesting. So that this morning we are on, um, in Galatians chapter 5 verse 22, when you find it, you say, amen. If you don't have it, say, hold up. Amen. So most of us are there. We're ready to go. All right? So Galatians 5 22 says, read it with me, please. But the fruit of the spirit is love, joy, Peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such there is no law. And they that are Christ have crucified the flesh and with the affections and lusts. If we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. Let us not be desirous of vain glory, provoking one another, envying one another. This morning, we start in this series looking at the fruit of the Spirit. And as I said, over the next few weeks, in fact, we're going to be here for the next month or so, right? I hope you all have endurance, right? So that, because we're going to be spending about a month in this part looking at the fruit of the Spirit. And today, we are looking at the fruit of the Spirit is love, right? And... Um, and we're going to be getting into understanding a bit what this whole perspective of love is. And of course, the, today, we're not going to exhaust this topic, right? Because we have, um, next week, we're going to be getting into a little more of the love story, <laughs> right? But we want to understand some principles here, right? As it pertains to the fruit of the Spirit being love. And of course, we see some other elements of the fruit of the Spirit that we see there are some commentators who suggest that the fruit of the Spirit is love singular and that the other eight items are part of this whole um, concept of love. There are some who say that there is nine fruit of the Spirit, that these are nine distinct elements or nine distinct characteristics right, of, that the Holy Spirit will bring to you. Whatever approach you may take, right, in terms of whether it's uh, one fruit and different components of the same fruit, or whether it's nine fruits of the Spirit, whichever approach you take, the bottom line is, there are nine things that need to be evident in our lives. Yeah. I think that makes sense, doesn't it? And we can get past some of the theological debate, all due respect to theologians in our midst, but we can get past some of the theological debate and get down to the nitty-gritty, there is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance that we need to see evident in our lives. And one, the primary one that we see that's first mentioned here, and you see it expanded throughout the scripture, is that of love. So that we need to be able to see our Christian witness need to be testifying that we have love. So that this morning, we want to start looking at this whole concept of love. What is love? And many times in our world today, you find love is a word that you will find battering all the place. So for example, when a man loves a woman, how the song goes? When a man loves a woman. Uh -huh. Go ahead, sister. Go ahead. You're singing good. What? I still didn't get what happens when a man loves a... He sleeps out in the rain. That's... <laughs> 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 so 
So the world have a perspective on love, not so? This word is so, such a, 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 a strange word that, that I, I love my wife. I love God. But then I love this puppy. <laughs> I love ice cream. I love my car. With the same word that we say, I love my wife and I love God. I don't know if you get what I'm saying. So that it's, it's, it's our English language kind of limits us in terms of the expression of what, of what love is. And what we understand that, that Greeks, the Greeks were not so. They had different words for love. So they had eros. That's the love that a lot of you all know about. Eros. And then there is agape. There's filio. There's storge. But we have different words for love that the Greeks had. Correct? Now, and a lot of times when we talk about love, we have a different impression of what it is. But for our series, we're going to be looking at the Bible definition of love. Is that okay? Now, the Bible uses two, major, two key words for love. Now, we have different aspects of it, right? But there are two major words that we see. So agape, which is noun, and they have different aspects of that word agape. And then there's filio, and they have different aspects of that word filio. The other one, and a lot of times people will look at, at um, stoge and, and eros, but we do have really... Uh, it's been found in the Bible. So eros is not a word that is used within the biblical text. And storge is not used directly within the text. There's one or two references of it where it's used from an antonym perspective. So the opposite of storge is being used in the text and you see it also used as part of a compound word. But that in itself is not word. If, if, uh, sometimes it's added to some derivatives of feel you. But why am I telling you all this? Because of the fact that we want to look at how the Bible looks at love for us to be able to understand this perspective of love. Now let me start with feel you, right? Because feel you is that love that we know a bit more of. That's that verb that speaks about to cherish. It's packed with emotions. It's like to be fond of something. You see, you, you, you really like somebody. You know when you say, you see somebody and you really like them? But instead of saying you like them, you say, I love you. And there's a lot of emotion that goes with that, correct? Yeah. So that is a nice feeling. That's the one that a lot of us like to feel. We want to have that, 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 that nice feeling. And there are parts of that that talks about friendship, love, and, and that, that whole perspective of that warmth of love that everyone craves for. It's an emotional love. It's an affectionate love. It's emotional, res uh, emotional responses are ignited when you see somebody that you love. Feel you. But then you have agape, and agape is different. Agape, it looks at the value of that object. You assess, you see this person, what's the value that this person has? You think about God, what's the value that God is in your, to you? How do you esteem this person? And then you, so that your, 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 your perspective on that person is what determines whether you love them or you don't love them. So it's a respect or honoring because of the perceived or inherent worth of that individual. Activities arising out of agape are primarily acts of the will. Acts of the what? It's not emotional love. That is why it can be commanded. The perceived value that you have is what brings that respect for this object that you say you love. When the Bible says here, the fruit of the Spirit is love, the word there is not feel you. It's agape. So that it's not an emotion that we are talking about. 
It's something more than that emotion. Because many times when we think about love and we say, okay, well, the fruit of the Spirit is love, the first thing we want to think about is how we feel about this person or how we feel about God or how we feel about our husband or how we feel about our wife. And agape goes beyond feelings. Amen? Amen? So it's important for us to understand that because as we go on and we start talking about love, you're going to recognize that our whole focus or our major focus is agape. And agape, that word is translated sometimes in the King James as charity. So that when you see the word charity, it's most times or more often than not, if not all the time, it is agape that is being used. So we have that word love. Say love. love. So that it's never, it's, it's also agape, which is the verb, is never controlled by emotions. Emotions is not involved in that necessarily. It's always controlled by the will. Amen? So when it talks about love, we're talking about a decision to love. As we proceed through this series, you're going to be looking at this whole concept of love from the perspective of agape. And we're going to recognize that what God did in his word is that he made this whole perspective of love to be a fruit of the spirit. And a fruit is something that is produced by something else. So for example, well, this is a fake plant. Um, you know, I, I love mangoes, right? Very good. So those of you who did not know, now you know. Right? So I, I love starch mango. And that's not agape starch mango. Eh? <laughs> so it's toge starch mango. So hear this. I love starch mango. You have a tree, and the tree bears fruits. So you have this fruit, and this fruit is a product of a tree. That tree actually produces this mango, correct? When you look at a mango tree, you see the product of this mango tree, which is a starch mango. Nice, golden, sun yellow, really looking nice. This is the fruit of that tree. It is nice. The tree was planted. The, mango, the seed died. The tree grew up. And then there's product from this. So based on the nature of that mango tree, the fruit comes out. Correct? I think we can be safe to say that the tree produces fruit after its kind. So that whatever that tree is, the fruit comes out as a result. So now if you have a soil, if you have soil and you plant a mango seed, you will expect that a mango tree will be produced. If you plant an orange seed, you will expect orange tree. If you plant lime, you're going to get something sour. Not so? And what we are understanding, brothers and sisters, is that there's a fruit that we have, and it's the fruit of something. It's the fruit of what? The spirit. So it's the spirit that produces something. So that these things that we, these elements that we're going to be looking at are elements or characteristics that have been produced by the spirit of God. So whatever the Spirit of God would have been planted in you, that is what is going to come forth. So when you have the Spirit of God on the inside of you, the maturity takes place. What's that word? Because you don't see a young tree bearing fruit. The, the mature tree is what produces fruit. So we have the Holy Spirit that comes into our lives and we start to become mature. And by virtue of the Spirit of God on the inside of us, we start to produce something after His kind. So that the character of the Spirit of God starts being visible in us. So that when people see us and they interact with us who have been mature in Christ, you start seeing product that we call fruit. And he says it's the fruit of the 
spirit. It's the character of the spirit of God. So that which is on the inside of God, that which is on the inside of the spirit of God is deposited on the inside of us. As we continue to grow, you see these things being made manifest. And the challenge with us, brothers and sisters, is that for many of us, we try to create a semblance as if we have this. Not understanding that all we need to do to really bring forth the fruit is first of all, be connected to the vine. Be connected to the source. And then you're going to be able to maintain. It says, if you abide in me, and I in you, what's going to happen? You will be a fruit. You will be a fruit. So what we want to be able to do is to connect with Christ. Tell your neighbor, I want to connect with Christ. And that starts off by us being submitted. And last day we looked a lot about the submission and that whole perspective of us being submitted to Christ. So I want to say this, the fruit of the Spirit is therefore the character of the Spirit of God that is produced in the life of the believer. So you have the character of the Spirit of God that is produced in the life of the believer. And that comes as a result of us connecting with Christ himself and his Spirit flowing through us. His Spirit bringing the change in us. His Spirit bringing that testimony in us that we are children of the living God. Because of that connection with Christ that we maintain, the growth that comes as a result of that is what is called sanctification. That we come to that place now whereby the Holy Spirit sets us apart and brings us into that place of being able to produce, say produce, produce. the fruit. Because it's not in our own strength or our own ability, it's only in what Christ has done. What he has done is what prepares us now for this particular work of sanctification. The Holy Spirit actually starts working in us to bring us to, bring us to that place of maturity in Christ. These godly characteristics that the Holy Spirit brings, and the first one that we're looking at, as I said, is love. It originates from the Spirit of God. It originates from whom? It originates from the Spirit of God. And the way the world sees these things, the world will not be able to receive these things. They will not be able to understand these things. They can't, they can't live the way that we are to live because of the fact that this originates from the Spirit of God. But you know what I find the strange thing is? That even though the world does not receive these things, the world would not have the fruit of the Spirit, I find it passing strange that there are some people who are in the world that seems to love more than us in the church. So while we are the ones who are supposed to be connected to Christ, we are the ones who are supposed to have the Spirit of God living in us, we are the ones who are supposed to be in Him and He in us, and we are the ones who are supposed to be maturing in Christ, we are not the ones who are showing the fruit. And you find there are people who seem to love more than we can love, who seem to be able to have more peace than us, who seem to be able to have more joy than us, because we somehow or the other have lost the understanding that our identity in Christ is supposed to produce something different in us. When we looked at over the last couple of days, a couple of weeks, and we looked at the works of the flesh that needed to be crucified, that needed to, we see that a lot of it, and some people said to me, they say, Pastor, a lot of these things I see in my life still. And that's the reality of it. And we have to reach to that place, brothers and sisters, whereby we are more submissive to God and the things of God so that he can work in us to work these things out and allow the Holy Spirit to flow through us. Because if we don't allow the Spirit of God to move on the inside of us, if we don't come to that place of submission to God and his Holy Spirit, then we're going to see these works continuing in us and we are not going to be able to see the manifestation of his fruit in our lives. The challenge is our maturity. We have to get to that place of maturity. I said before, fruit is abiding. Turn with me to John chapter 15. What verse 4 says? 
He says, abide in me and I in you, as the branch cannot do what? Bear fruit except it of itself, except it abide in the vine. No more can he except he abide in me. So he's saying that unless we are in Christ, we cannot bear fruit. So then I have a problem. Why then we have so much believers who are not bearing fruit? <laughs> That's a big problem. Because when I interact with people, I've been saved for about 26 years now. And I'm interacting with people on a day-to-day -day basis. And I'm realizing that a lot of believers are not fruit bearers. There are interactions that I have with people, and I said some time ago that I remember going and doing business with people, and some of the worst people that you can do business with are people who profess to be Christians. There are people who are in schools, and they behave, and their conduct in schools are so horrible when you find out that they are believers, quote-unquote. Why is that so? Why is it that when we profess Christ, we are not living the way that we are supposed to live? We are not really displaying the fruit. When he says, it's by your fruit you shall be known. So that when we look at the life of a believer, we're supposed to be able to see some evidence of Christianity in them. More than just the speaking in tongues. More than just the hallelujah. More than just the Sunday morning experience. Yes, you could dress nice for church. But what about the life that we live? How are we displaying it? And what he's saying here is this. If you abide in me, so that I'm asking myself, how many of us are really in Christ? So that I'm asking that. Because of the fact that if Christ would, and if we are to take God at his word, he's saying if you abide in me, you will be a fruit. And I in you. So that fruit bearing really is based on connectivity. That when we are connected with Christ, when we are abiding in him, and he in us, when we allow his word to reside within our hearts, this is where we're going to start seeing the change taking place. That the Holy Spirit now is going to work something on the inside of us. And that's the challenge that I want us to be able to come to, being able to overcome. So we want the Spirit of God to work. Amen? Amen? And you see, why this is important, brothers and sisters, is because somehow or the other, I believe that the church needs to really be the church. And if it is that we continue to pretend, that's all we're going to have. I don't want us to remain conceited to think that because we see more people coming, because we see more people, whatever, and because I don't want us to think that that's where the growth is. That's one part of it. But we have to understand that our growth has to be more quanti qualitative than quantitative. What do I mean by that? It's more than just more numbers. But you see who we have? They need to be real. And this is my desire. It's better that, that all of us grow together. Now, that's not a reality. That's not a, something that is actually going to happen because there are some people going to drop off the wagon. Some people are going to hear this this morning and, and whatever you say, yes, Pastor, I just come from church and you know this is my religious do. But my challenge to you, brothers and sisters, is for us to go beyond just religion and to be able to really connect with Christ and allow that impact of the Holy Spirit to move on the inside of us to produce something that is going to be visible to those people who are around us. To be able to produce something on the inside of us that when others see us, they can testify that you have been with Christ. When people see us, they must know without reason of a doubt. You see that man? You see that woman? She's genuine. He genuine. Because when the fruit is produced, brothers and sisters, there is a testimony on the outside that people can see because what he says that you will be known. 
And one of the first things that we got to see evidence in our lives as Christians is that fruit of love. Is that fruit of what? Love. You see, brothers and sisters, love is that virtue that, that really separates us from the world. When we have testified of Christ Jesus, when we put our faith in Christ Jesus, when we have accepted Jesus Christ as Lord and we have really put our faith in Christ, the next step is for us to be able to step up, live a life of love. Matthew chapter 22. Verse 36. Master, which is the greatest commandment in the law? Which is the greatest commandment where? In the law. Jesus said unto him, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul and with all thy mind. This is the first and great commandment. And the second is like unto it. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the So he says on these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. What's the two commandments? One, love God. Love people. Shortened version. So that we are, Jesus here is looking at this, he, he's answering or he's responding to this, this question. And of course, I think they were trying to trap him or whatever as the case may be. You know, they always try to do that. But his response to them was this. This is the great commandment. One, love the Lord thy God. Not half-heartedly, but wholeheartedly. To really commit that love, that attention, that affection to God. And then the second is like none to it. What is the second one? Love your neighbor as you love yourself. And how many of you all know that that's important for us to do? Not so? But I want to challenge you to go to the next step. Because that's one good thing and it's a good approach to have. And it's one that we start with. Not so? How many of you all love yourself? Let me see your hands. And that's good. That's good, you love yourself. But I've seen a lot of times people establish with this the whole focus of self-centeredness. And they said, okay, well, you know, you've got to love yourself first and you've got to love... And We're not going to go down that road today. Next week, we're going to go down that road. Is that okay? But Jesus pushes us to a next level. And look at the next level that he pushes us to. Because it's one thing to love the Lord thy God with all your heart and love your neighbor as yourself. But then there's another thing that he says. John chapter 13, verse 34. A new commandment I give unto you. That he what? Love one another as yourself. So not just loving people as yourself. He's now raising the bar. So it's one thing, you see, when we build this whole doctrine and say, okay, well, you know, you've got to love yourself, you've got to love yourself, you've got to love yourself, you've got to love yourself. It's one thing, but now Jesus is raising the bar. And he's saying something here. He says, a new commandment, a what? A what? A new commandment I'm giving to you. And what is this new commandment? That he love one another as what? I have loved e you, so e also love one another. And look at what verse 35 says. By this shall all men know that ye are my disciples, if ye have love one for another. You see, one of the things, brothers and sisters, that testifies of our discipleship, and this church has a discipleship mandate. And what he's saying that we got to do? Love one another. <laughs> Look at your neighbor. Look at the person next to you. And tell him I got to love you. <laughs> that kind of uncomfortable, not so? And you know why it's uncomfortable? Because of our whole perspective of what love is. And you remember what we just said, agape. So this is not eros. So I ain't telling you to watch the person and say, I got to love you. <laughs> That's not what I tell you to do. 
And I know some people are glad. They said, oh, that's that nice lady. And they say, oh, gosh, pastor. <laughs> tell me to tell her. <laughs> Don't worry, that lady married her. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> eh? You see? Look, look, look sister, I didn't make you out. You wanted to say that all the time. But you understand this. Hear what he says. He's raising the bar now. It's more than just loving as you love yourself. But love in a different way. How to love now? As I have loved you. Now that's challenging. And I'll tell you why this is challenging. Because our, our natural nature, our humanness, prevents us from being able to love like Christ's love. It's difficult for us to do that. It's, in fact, I'll tell you this. In ourselves, it is absolutely impossible. <laughs> to love like Christ's love. Hmm? Let's turn to Matthew chapter 5. Let me look at Christ's love. How he's teaching us to love. Because he said this is a new word. And because agape is not filial, it could be commanded. Because with commandments, you don't need emotion to deal with it. You just obey what has been said. You understand what I'm saying? So it's not just about how I feel. So when he tells you, love your neighbor as I have loved you, or love one another as I have loved you, this has nothing to do with how you feel about the man. This has nothing to do with how you feel about the woman. This is how you feel about God. <laughs> this is what it has. This is what it comes back down to. So when he tell you, love as I love. How do you relate to the I who said that? How do you get what I'm saying to us? In Matthew chapter 5, 43. You have, said, you have heard that it is said, Thou shalt love thy neighbor. And hate thine enemy. How many of you all like that verse? <laughs> love your neighbor. But you see your enemy? You got to hate them. You have heard it said that. I don't know where you heard it said, but it was said. <laughs> they heard it said. I don't think that was one of the laws of God. But this, I say unto you. Who said this? Jesus. So you hear it said to love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I am telling you something different. But I am saying, love your enemies. Do what? <laughs> so wait. The same person who cuts you up life right and center. That's the person you got to love, right? The same person who thief your land. That's the person who you got to love, right? The same person who, who, who do all kind of wickedness to you. That's the same person that you got to love. Is that your enemy? What he's saying here is love your enemies. And he didn't stop there. Watch what he says. Bless them that curse you. So somebody is wishing you bad. And Jesus is telling you that even though that person curse you, even though that person wish you bad, they say that you're going to do this and you're going to, that, that you know you're not going to prosper, you're not going to do well. In spite of the fact that that person curse you. I don't think he meant cost you in this case. But even if they cost you, what he's saying to do? So he says here, bless them that curse you. And do good to them that hate you. And pray for them that despitefully use you and persecute you. And the prayer that he's saying here is not, Lord, let the vengeance of Amoko fall on them. That's not the prayer he's talking about. It's not that you're going and pull one of the Psalms and saying, you know, it has Psalms that talk about the destruction of your enemy. That's not what he's talking about. Some people like them Psalms. <laughs> That's not the prayer that he's talking about. He says, pray for them that despitefully use you and persecute you. They're using you in a wrong way. They're persecuting you and you got to pray for them to do well. This Christianity started to look difficult, that's so. <laughs> it's near impossible, not so. And this is why it has to be nothing else but the fruit of the Spirit to produce this kind of action. If you try to reason this out for yourself, 
it's not happening. In fact, when you start to reason it out, you know you get more reasons why you got to cuss this man. <laughs> you got more reasons why you got to hate this person. Love? Lord, you ain't know what he do me. So let's try it. Let's analyze it. What did he do you? He beat you up. What did he do you? He took your money. He borrowed money from you and never pay back. Oh, that's a familiar one, that's a... What did he do you? He do all type of thing. But let's check it out. Did he... Well, some of them spit on you, yeah. <laughs> what about the crown tones? They put crown tones on your head? They beat you with any cat of nine? And the cat of nine that they whipped Jesus with, it is said that it had some metal in it. And when he... One lash, they pull it and your back digs up. They kneel you on the cross. Talk to me. And the nails, isn't them two inch concrete nail that they had in it? That's not what they had when they say kneel on the cross, you know. I don't know if you get what I'm saying. What about when you're thirsty? You're dying and you're dying breath. They, they ask for water and they put vinegar. Then they stab you in your side on the cross. Talk to me. Come on. Are you in here? What they do you? <laughs> what they do? And while Jesus is nailed on the cross, bleeding to death, he looks down at them looks at the father and said, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. You tell me them didn't know what they was doing? <laughs> eh, pastor? That man very well know what he do. He's a dirtiness. He know what he do. <laughs> That's what we think. But Jesus looked at them in the midst of his crucifixion. And in the midst of that turmoil, he was able to say to the Father, Father, forgive them. There's, hardly, there's nobody I know who would have gone through what Christ went through. But yet he says, forgive them. And we say, burn them. That's our response. For much less than that. Somebody bounced us on our big toe and we want to kill them for that. We had to be able to understand when he talks about love as I love. It's not no religious thing we've been talking about here. This is real life thing. And it's a high call. And the only way we can reach to that place, brothers and sisters, is not in human effort. This is why it has to be a product of the Spirit of God working on the inside of us. That tree had to be planted. There's no way that that fruit can come forth with your own effort. There's no way you could think about just in your own self saying that this man have done me this, that woman have done me this, and I can just look at them and say I forgive you and walk away. You know what forgiveness means? True forgiveness is to erase a wrong. A wrong has been done and you erase it. That's what forgiveness is. And what he said here, Father, forgive them. That's love. Only forget what I'm saying to us. When he's displaying this, look at the next verse. He's telling us to do this. Love your enemies. Bless them that curse you. Do good to them that hate you and pray for them that despitefully use you and persecute you that you may be what? Children of your Father which is in heaven. For he maketh the sun to rise on the evil and on the good and send the rain on the just and the unjust. For if you love them which love you, what reward have you? So that we like to love people who love us. And that's all. You see he? Them, he don't have pain on me in no mind. He don't pay me in no interest. I turn away from them. 
So what about the unlovable? That's what he's saying. If you only love the lovable, if you only love those who love you, what difference it makes? How does that make you different from the heathen who's out there? That's what he's saying here. And if you only hail up, if you only salute your brethren, what do you more than others? Don't even the publicans do that? How do you get what I'm saying here? Those people who were seen as those who were, um, the publicans were those tax collectors, those who were seen as, as smart man, con men, they used to thief people money, give, um, rake up the taxes and do all kinds of things that were wrong. Don't they even do that when they see their fellow tax collectors? Hey, how are you going? What's up? Who are you healing up? Who are you saluting? The passing people in the street. And you know what? <laughs> you know what's the hard part, Bishop? We passing people in church straight too. People who we supposed to know. Going down to church. Everybody going down to church, you know. Hey, look up in that life person. Hey, how you going? I'll see you in church. <laughs> I wonder if you get what I'm saying to us. You see, if you only salute them that salute you, what difference it make? And the thing about it is that we're saluting people and we're not extending. <laughs> Don't even the publicans so? Look at verse 40, 48. Be it therefore perfect, even as your Father which is in heaven is perfect. Well, that verse, oh gosh, we lost you. Theologically, we lost you there. <laughs> Because you see, you see me, I ain't trying for no perfection, huh? You see me? That's what you're talking about. Oh, I know I'm not perfect. And that, you see that? That is the biggest cup out of all of us. I know I'm not perfect. So that means we could do anything. You know why? We're not perfect. <laughs> and I am not saying that you're perfect. I'm not saying that I'm perfect. I'm not saying that anyone of, of us is perfect. But let us strive towards perfection, huh? Let us reach to that place. And in fact, what he was talking about here was not necessarily just being perfect and sinless. And this really talks about that aspect of perfect love. Being able to express love in a particular way like God does it. Can we do that? In your own strength, you can't. This is why we need to be filled with the Spirit of God. This is why we need the Spirit of God to intervene in our lives. We need to submit to the work of the Spirit of God because it's a work that He does on the inside of us to bring that out of us. It is not something that we can manufacture for yourself. Try your best. You're going to go mad because there are some people who I tell you, if you take them on, you will go mad. M-A-D. D-D-D-D. So there are some people like that. But what you have to do is realize that I cannot do it in myself. I need help. I need help. If you try to do it on yourself, by yourself, you're not, it's not happening. So you need help. So what do we do? How do we get help? Luke 13, 11, 13. If you then be an evil, know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more shall your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to them that? And before that, he say, ask, and it shall be given. Seek, you shall find. Knock, and it shall be opened unto you. So guess what? All we need to do is to come to that place of humbly asking God, Lord, I need your Holy Spirit. And not in a joking way, you know, sometimes you go through a stress and you say, Lord, help me. No, not like that. That will be serious. Where you intently, so you submit yourself and say, Lord, I really need your presence now in my life. You see, this whole thing that we're talking about in terms of overcoming the works of the flesh, because all that we talk about in terms of the anger and the hatred and the maliciousness and the wrath and all these things, that, that, that come as a result of the work of the flesh, you know. And you remember what he says that we got to do in order to overcome the work of the flesh? What do we got to do? Walk in the spirit. So what we need to do is to come to that place of asking God, Lord, I need your Holy Spirit. Because if, in order for me to overcome, I need the spirit of God. 
I need to walk in the Spirit. I need to have the Holy Spirit in my life. I need to have him really and truly take charge of my life. I need to be surrendered to the Holy Spirit. So I need to ask, Lord, Lord, help me. I need your Holy Spirit to take charge over my life. And when we ask, we must be willing to submit. Because that's the next challenge now. We could ask and we could say, Pastor, say ask. But it's not because I say ask. You must want. Because there are lots of us who you will just say, obey what I say. Okay, well, Pastor, say ask for the Holy Spirit. And you know, I ask and I ain't get. But because you didn't want it. And we have to be able to understand, I need the Spirit of God to be at work in my life. I need to submit to the Spirit of God. I need to submit to what God wants to do in me. I need to change my life. And the only way the change can come is if the Spirit of God starts working on the inside of me. If the Spirit of God is not working on the inside of me, there is nothing that is going to be produced. Because for too many of us, we think that we're going to be able to change by, by willpower. We think that we're going to be able to change by just us being able to make up our mind and say, okay, well, you know, I, yes, you, 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 um, you have the strength and you have the ability to change. And you, that's not happening. There are plenty of people much better than all of us who try and they fail. And the only reason why they did not make it is because of the fact that in our own strength, we can do nothing. We need to be able to submit to God, His Holy Spirit, and ask Him, Lord, give me your Holy Spirit. I need you now. Because it's only in Christ Jesus that we can have the victory. We can't have it any other way. No matter what you do, you could come to church from Sunday to Sunday. You could spend 24 hours a day fasting, 24 every day for, 20, for, 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 for a whole year. And it's not going to happen if you don't submit to the Holy Spirit. And if you get what I'm saying to us, we need to change. And the change that is necessary is for us to change our perspective. Firstly, I need God. That's the perspective you need to have. And I need God to move in my life. I cannot do it on my own. So ask him, Lord, I need your Holy Spirit. Come into my life. The dwelling of God on the inside of us is through his Holy Spirit. That's how God lives on the inside of us. A few months ago, we dealt with the, the deity of the Spirit of God. We did a, a series that we, we taught you on that. So you understand that the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of, of God, is God's presence in you. That's the presence of God on the earth today. And he commands to dwell on the inside of you. And he can live on the inside of you. And he's the one who actually brings that identity that you are Christian. We said the other day, uh, for those of you who missed it, we said that they that are led by the Spirit of God, they are the children of God. And you hear what he says here, Jesus says here, that you're going to be like your father. Then you're going to be children of your father. The only way we can be children of the father is if we are led by the Spirit of God. So we have to submit to his leading. We have to submit to his direction in order for us to be able to come to that place of victory. You want to be able to love like Christ loved? You need the Spirit of God. Otherwise, we're not going to be able to do it. No matter what we say, no matter what we do, no matter who we with, there are some people who real there. They get a real nice lady. Lady, real nice, real, everything good. And we're not talking about shape. You remember, we don't talk. There are some people who shape different. So some people like preference different. Yeah? So it's not about, it's about person. You find that this lady, real nice person. But you're rotten to the core. <laughs> And you don't want to lose this girl. She in church, she living her life nice, she pure, she everything. And you don't want to lose this girl. But you're rotten to the core. And you realize that inside of you, you don't have love, you don't have peace, you don't have joy, you don't have long suffering, you don't have any of these qualities. To, to make a long story short, you're hoggish. You know anybody like that? Don't say, don't put up your hand. <laughs> How does that change? You have no self-control. How does that change? You don't have no genuine love. You don't care for anybody. How does that change? 
And no matter how much you try to, you realize it's not changing. Why? Because the only way that it can change is through this presence of the Holy Spirit coming in to take charge over your life. And that requires submission. What's that word? Submission. You see, unless the Holy Spirit can move on the inside of you to bring that change, brothers and sisters, no change is taking place. I looked at my life when I was growing up, and I realized that there was change that needed to take place in me. I looked at certain aspects and certain elements of my heritage, my, my heritage for want of a better word. I saw no good example of manhood in, around me, none whatsoever. The examples that I had of fatherhood were poor examples. I thank God for, for my mother, but I did not have a good example of fatherhood. And there were times where I saw that trend starting to come up on the inside of me. But then I got saved at age 17. And immediately after I got saved, I started to do um, ministry training. And I allowed the Holy Spirit to take charge of my life. I submitted. One of the things that with me, I was obedient. When I hear this, I do in what was told. I wonder if you get what I'm saying to us. So I submitted to the, the instructions of the word. There was change that was needed on the inside of me. And I know that it could not have happened just like that. If it wasn't for the grace of God, I may, I, you don't know where I could have been. Before I got saved, I started to read different things. I was studying Islam. I was studying Jehovah's Witnesses. Different things like that I wanted to do. But then God arrested me. And I submitted to that. And he started to bring change on the inside of me. The Holy Spirit ministered directly on the inside of me to produce a different man. And I remember for years, almost every night, when I kneeled down to pray, I said, Lord, help me to be a different man. You know why? I did not want to see me in the future be that which I saw in the past. And for some of us, we need to recognize that that which was in the past got to stay in the past. Whether it's your father, whether it's your grandfather, or whether it's you in the past, got to stay in the past and submit now to the work of the Holy Spirit. Any man that is in Christ is a new creature. So that the Spirit of God has to take charge. And as I say, I was 17. So you're not too young. There are some of you 30, 40 years old and older and still will not submit yourself to the changing work of the Spirit of God. How long will we continue along the same path? God wants to do something. And the only way it can be done is through submission. We have to submit to the work of the Spirit. You could start to love differently. You could love differently. But allow God to work in you. And next week we're going to be talking a bit more about love. And we're going to define this concept of love. We're going to show you from 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Uh, chapter 13, sorry. 15 characteristics of love. You're going to get a handout just like we did with the works of the flesh. And you're going to see the 15 characteristics of love. And how it can be applied to your life as an individual. Because we need to do it. We need to. And when we apply these principles in our lives, you're going to see victory in you. You see the works of your flesh? Those things don't have to cripple you. It doesn't have to. You could break free from it. But the only way we're breaking free is if we are led by the Spirit of God. And he says, they that are led by the Spirit of God will overcome. That's what it's about. And you know what is the next good reward? And I'm closing on this. You will not be condemned. You understand what I'm saying to you? He says, there is therefore now no condemnation to them that are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. Let us abandon the right to be wrong. I wonder if you understand what I'm saying. Because many of us feel that we have the right to be how we are. And that's not true. We need to change. 
And the only way that the change comes with submission. Say, I will submit. Let's stand before the presence of God.